This meeting is being recorded. Good afternoon, dear colleagues. My name is Agathe Rangruel, and together with my friend and colleague, Dr. Biserka Gaidarska, we welcome you to the fourth presentation in the series of the ARVA online lectures devoted to the North Pontic and Southeast Balkans. It is a great pleasure to introduce our today's speaker, Natasha Reynolds, who is currently an honorary researcher at the University of Bordeaux. After BA in archaeology and Slavonic studies in, at Sheffield, Natasha moved to the London Institute of Archaeology for a Master of Science in Paleoanthropology and Paleolithic Archaeology before taking her PhD at Oxford on the mid-upper Paleolithic of European Russia in 2014. She stayed in Oxford for a postdoc with Tom Heim's um, Paleochron project and then moved to Bordeaux for, the two, for two postdocs in the PASEA group and the second, the prestigious Marie Curie Fellowship. Natasha has a string of influential publications in key journals, including three papers in antiquity on European upper Paleolithic chronology and a long series of papers on various Kostienki sites, including Radiocarbon, Quaternary International, the Journal of Archaeological Science, the Journal of Human Evolution and the Proceedings of Prehistoric Society. She has also contributed chapters to three important recent books on Gravetian societies, Convergent Evolution, and the stimulatingly titled Human-Elephant Interactions. Today she will be presenting her, her recent research on an alternative interpretation of what many people have called mammoth bone structures, or huts, but which Natasha believes were something to totally different. Natasha, thank you for accepting our invitation and the ARVA screen is now yours. Thank you very much, Agatha, for that um, very kind introduction. Um, just to clarify before we, we go forward, the format for this, um, I'll speak for about 40, 40, 45 minutes, is that right? And then we'll have some questions. Yeah, perfect. Yeah. Okay. We have time Great. an hour and a half for the Open for a presentation and a question part. So. Okay, fantastic. Um, all right, well, yeah, thank you all so very much for being here. Um, thank you for the, the opportunity to present to you. Um, it's a real pleasure to talk about this research. Um, I, I am a little bit outside of my usual wheelhouse um, in this project. I'm, I'm really someone who has a, um, a normal specialism in uh, stone tools and in chronology um, and maybe a bit of archaeological theory. Um, so this um, particular research project, which is you know, very focused on, on zoo archaeology, um, you know, really owes its existence to um, the colleagues whose work I'm going to be talking about um, today. Um, and I, just to give you a little bit of background, um, I was asked to contribute to um, writing up um, something in, in English about about this about the site of Udineva and about this this new interpretation, um, and so the the um, contribution that I've made to it is really just in expanding some of the, the theoretical arguments about um, what's going on. But um, really, as I, as I think you'll see, um, you know, all of the the hard work and it's, and the the rethinking and the ideas um, come primarily from um, my colleagues. Um, so it's yeah, it's 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 a real it's a real um, fun thing for me to present because it's it's just something that I've been lucky to be involved in and that I I, I find absolutely fascinating, um, and which I'm a little bit of an outsider to as, as well. Um, so to get into it, um, many of you will be familiar with the the mammoth bone structures. Um, of the area north of the Black Sea um, that date to the late of the Paleolithic. They are you know, very frequently illustrated in um, textbooks. They are um, you know, the subject of you know, some very iconic um, museum uh, reconstructions and so on. And so some of these pictures will already, I think, be, be familiar to you. Um, this is from the site of Mazurich in, in Ukraine. Um, 
the, the structure there under excavation. And, you know, these wonderful um, chevron, chevron structures of, of the mammoth mandibles that have actually been put together around, around the edge of the structure. Um, and at that site, there was there were a, a number of a number of structures, and in the, the 1980s already, this was um, you know quite quite widely widely published as, as being the, the remains of, of dwelling structures. Um, the the reconstructions of these of of these of these dwelling structures often look something like this. Um, you know, there might be you know mammoth tusks um, being used to support. Um, you know, there are ideas about maybe there was wooden wooden supports, you know, in the middle of the structure to hold up the roof um, and so on. But, you know, they are undoubtedly just, you know, incredibly, you know, it's an incredibly eye catching idea. And it's, you know, an, an idea that I, I think has um, fascinated, you know, a huge number of, of um, archaeologists and non-archaeologists, um, you know, who've, who've come across it, you know, this this amazing idea that people were living in in these houses made out of out of mammoth bones um, during the last ice age in this part of the world. Um, several other sites where similar things were found. So Mazin, um, also in Ukraine, uh, Kostyanki Eleven uh, in Russia at the you know the major area of sites at, at Kostyanki Borshova. Um, this is the um, structure that's currently preserved inside a, inside a um, pavilion. It's got a, a roof built over it um, inside the museum there. Um, and then uh, outside the museum structure, there's this more recently excavated one, um, which I visited when I was there uh, nearly a decade ago now. Um, actually, fully a decade ago now, time flies. Um, and you know, that's a, that's a, you know just a, a really a huge um, accumulation of, of mammoth of mammoth bones um, that uh, yeah, has been you know receiving a, a, a fair amount of attention um, from, from from different specialists because it's um, been a, a really great opportunity to to excavate one of these um under uh, modern um uh, under under modern conditions and the geographical um distribution that we're looking at looks something like this um so they're in it's in a reasonably restricted part of of Europe that these are found the, the ones at Kostyanki are the most uh, easternmost um, that we know of um, and the rest of them are in a in a uh, fairly restricted area um, mostly around the Dnieper watersheds in um, in Ukraine and in uh, far western Russia. Um, in terms of the dating of these sites what we're looking at is sort of so uh, Greenland Stadial 2 um, sort of just the, the, the earliest ones that we that we know of, you know, at Kostyanki 11, um, date to sort of around about, um, you know, the last national maximum as it's, as it's usually uh, defined. Um, and then other ones have uh, somewhat later dates. I wouldn't take all of these dates at face value, to be honest, given my experience of, of working on um, Russian middle Paleolithic um, chronology and earlier Paleolithic chronology. Um, I think um, without maybe a little bit more critical analysis and probably redating of some of these sites, we don't really have a great handle on, on their chronology. Um, but certainly they date to the late upper Paleolithic. I think we can say that. Um, but you know, the, the what the, the the real range of um, what the real range of uh, dates might look like. I'm, I'm not really sure that we that we we, we totally understand. Um, I would also note here that there are um, some really major mammoth bone accumulations in found largely in Central Europe um, that date to a little bit earlier than this. 
um, so um, more to the middle Paleolithic period, the Gravatian period. Um, and these have sometimes you know, also been related to the, the, the more um, formalized structures um, of this area. Um, and you, you know, they, they, I think also, you know, merit a lot, a lot more investigation. Um, my colleague, Jarek Wilczynski, Jaroslav Wilczynski at Krakow um, is currently working on a um, major ERC project, um, which is looking again at some of those mammoth bone accumulations. So I'll be really excited to see the, the um, results that will eventually come out of that project. Now, the consensus on these, um, on these structures for many decades has been that they represent the remains of dwelling structures. Um, and this, um, there's sort of a two sides, I mean, there's sort of two sides to the story because inside Soviet archeology, span there was you know, a huge amount of um, theoretical uh, argumentation and, uh, you know, interpretation that, that, that was, was um, you know, centered around these, these, these structures. Um, they were defined by um, Alexander Rogachev, who is an archeologist who I, you know, really respect a huge amount, um, you know, having spent a long time during my PhD um, studying the collections that he'd excavated. I have, you know, so much, so much, you know, esteem for him as an archeologist. Um, and he defined this um, group of um, so-called Anasov, Me Anasov Mezen type dwellings based on the, this, um, this group of, of sites. Um, and so within Soviet archaeology, you had this, um, you know, the, this, this quite rich literature like discussing them. Um, and then that was sort of translated then into Western archaeology based on the work of the, you know, the relatively small number of, of Western archaeologists who can, who can read Russian, um, and based on the, the relatively small number of uh, publications that were also made um, of, these, of, these, um, of these sites in, in English and other languages. Um, so what we have is this, this kind of, yeah, this, this, this sort of two-side thing where you have the, in, in Russian, you have like a, quite a detailed literature about them. And then in English and French and so on, you have um, a much scarcer, I think, literature um, about, about the sites. And you, you, I think a lot of our, a lot of the, the Western sort of um, uh, perspective on them, you know, is, is, is really heavily based on like the pictures and it's based on the reconstruction. Um, and it's, it's a lot of people have been sort of, um, I guess, yes, yeah, sort of forced to take it at face value what what what's been what's been shown by these by these pictures and by these um, by these reconstructions because you know without actually you know engaging with the literature in Russian, um, it's or you know it's it's not going to be um, it's not going to be necessarily um, possible to to um, to understand what's what's going on there. Okay. Um, so more recently, so for many, many years, you know, this was this was seen um, in Soviet and in I guess early post-Soviet um, Russian archaeological practice. These were um, well, the party line, let's say, was that they were they were dwelling structures. And it's only been very, very recently that there's been more critical analysis of them. Um, and so some of the, the major, I think like the, one of the major steps forward that we've had in recent years um, is this work by um, my colleague Konstantin Gavrilov, um, which was uh, published in, in 2015. Where he goes and looks at the the history of Soviet archaeology and some of the the assumptions that were made 
um, at that point and which, we, which were not challenged. Um, and so what, what he finds is that um, there was a real emphasis on, on identifying dwelling structures in Soviet archaeology. Um, and this was in large part because the identification of dwelling structures was seen as a strength of Paleolithic Soviet archaeology, um, Soviet Paleolithic archaeology, um, because it, it, it was, it really was something that set apart um, the Paleolithic archaeology of this, of, of that part of the world, um, you know, as compared to, you know, for example, Western Europe. Um, and so because these apparent dwelling structures had begun to be um, recognized, you know, very early on in, in the 20th century, um, at sites like Kostyanki 1, at sites like um, Gagarina, uh, there was a real, there was a real impetus to, to, to you know, to continue to, to try and identify these sites. Um, and, you know, there is a good reason why, why these sites were, were being found, you know, in this, in this area, because, you know, it's, it's just the nature of the, the geology in um, Russia and Ukraine is such that um, the, the, there are, you know, open air sites are often preserved incredibly well, you know, under, under these, these lusic sediments. So it, it is actually, you know, um, possible to, to, to study these, you know, these, these very ancient dwelling structures. Um, but the flip side is that certain archaeologists may have gotten a little bit too uncritical about what they were identifying as dwelling structures. So the list of criteria that were being, being used to, to identify a dwelling structure was um, perhaps not as stringent as it needed to be. So basically any kind of structure that was, um, you know, had a clear, had a clear um, edge to it and which was, you know, clearly circular, for example, was typically identified as a, as a dwelling structure. Um, and that would be, you know, regardless of, of whether or not there was, for example, you know, a clear hearth identified in the middle of it, um, or, you know, regardless of the, you know, the, you know, the further details that we might now use to, to, try and, to try and identify a dwelling structure in the archaeological record. Um, so that work um, by Konstantin Kirillov on, on rethinking that was, you know, I think a really important step now towards like uh, the, the rethink of, of, of about these structures. Um, he did get some, you know, negative reactions to that article, like there's a, there's a published response to that article, you know, which takes, you know, um, which you know, heavily criticizes his, his, his argument, but I personally find them very persuasive. Um, in a slightly later article, um, it with um, um, Gennady Klepchov um, um, based in St. Petersburg, and uh, based especially on the material from Udinova, which is the site I'm going to be mainly discussing today, um, they go a little bit further and they say that the, the data that they have for Udinova indicates that the, the the structures like as they as they were excavated were found more or less in situ so they are not the result of a collapsed roof they are not the result of a, a collapsed dwelling structure and that obviously is um you know that that's a that's a, a big difference <laughs> from from saying from saying that you know this this these looks like the the results of a of a of a dwelling structure um okay uh, so the, the other major publication that we've had um, recently on these, on these sites is yeah, related to the, the, um, the site of Kostyanki 11, um, which I showed you a picture of, of earlier. It's a very, very large um, one at Kostyanki that's um, been under recent excavation. Um, and there again, so Alex Pryor and colleagues argue that the, the structure there is not the result of it's, it's not the remains of a dwelling structure. Um, and they, they, in fact, they float this idea that it might have something to do with um, food storage. 
Um, but in any case, you know, they, they reckon it's it's not the not the remains of, of a dwelling structure um, for for various various different reasons. I mean, the the size of it, you know, for a start is a is a is a persuasive um, piece of evidence. Like I've I've stood in the middle of it and it is it's really big, you know, it's really large. I can't imagine. I can't imagine, you know, it would be easy to, to build a roof like that, you know, using any materials at all. So um, the, you know, the, the, there has there has been, uh, you know, various, various, um, various uh, new perspectives coming through on, on these sites from, you know, from, from different groups of researchers. Now, the site of Udinova, which I'm going to be discussing, um, it's there. It's in a in a part of the world which is not somewhere that um, most of us are going to be visiting anytime soon. Uh, it's in far western Russia, um, quite close to the border with Ukraine, and the um, the there's been Excavations carried out there, you know, over a, a very long period, um, uh, right up to the present day. They again built this um, museum pavilion structure over the top of some of the of some of the um, uh, of some of the excavated area, as you'll see. So that's what it looks like from the from the outside now. Um, and then the inside, you can see that there is. Uh, you know, a, a series of a series of structures. It's a little bit tricky because I mean, the, this has been the, the excavated area, as you see it now, has been cleaned up very heavily. So I wouldn't try to, you know, like overthink um, too much the the exact kind of details of the of the um, structures as they appear today. Um, but you know, just to give you an idea, like there are, there are these you know extensive um, uh, structures that are, have been preserved, you know, in situ or you know somewhat in situ within the uh, within within the museum pavilion. There, um, the dating that we're looking at is somewhere around uh, uh, just shy of fifteen thousand radiocarbon years ago. Um, so yeah, it's laid up a Paleolithic. It's a it's Greenland Stadial Two, which is a long, stable, cold period. Um, so it was, it was certainly, you know, certainly one of the colder parts of the last ice age. But it was it, it was also a time when you didn't have quite as many rapid environmental changes as you did um in other time periods um and I, I think you know you can imagine um, for yourself like a an open an open step landscape um with some large herbivores there which um seem to have made a, a good living for the for the people who the people who, who lived there um, there, the lithic assemblage um, from there. Um, I'm not going to talk about it at all, but it's um, we, we call it epigravetian. Um, and the faunal assemblage from the site itself um, is very heavily dominated by mammoth and by Arctic fox. Um, so apart from the um, apart from the mammoth, there's definite evidence for um, you know large scale processing of of Arctic fox. Um, which may become uh, may become uh, interesting again to mention later. Um, and the mammoths um, that are represented there um, mainly pertain to um, adult cows and juveniles, uh, which is um, something you know something that's seen at other sites where so I mean so mammoth herds are matriarchal; they're dominated by um, or they they include um, the, the cows and the the, the babies, um, and so th this is this is um, what we're this is what was usually um, 
excuse me. This is this is what was um, uh, appeared to have been uh, focused on by the, the hunters who are who are at the site. Um, there are different areas um, that were different areas that were um, identified at the site. Um, so areas of flint mapping, ivory processing, and um, the fo fox um, fox processing. And there's a whole series of, of articles about the site. So if you're interested in it, there's you know a real um, interesting literature um, that's available um, in English um, as well as in Russian um, about it. Now, um, to give you an idea then of just the, the size of the site that we're looking at, the, the excavated area um, represented there is something like um, 40 by 40 meters. Um, and you can see there's five different um, structures that have been identified and are, are labeled there by number. Um, there's, a, apart from the, you know, the, the faunal remains and the lithic assemblage, there's a huge amount of um, really interesting worked ivory, shell, bone, um, that's also come from the, come from the site. And there's some, some really nice, um, some really nice finds. Um, and then to, to focus on, you know, a little bit onto the, the individual, the individual structures themselves. Um, so this, these are structures three and four, which are preserved inside the pavilion. Um, and there are a number of features of these, of these structures that are, that are important. Um, so altogether, um, if you count just the skulls, um, altogether, like between um, structures three and four, there's, um, I think about uh, more than 50, certainly mammoths represented, you know, between the, between these two between these two structures, um, large bones are very well represented, but there's also very clear sorting of bones. So, not quite as dramatic as what we saw at um, Majirich, where you had those those mammoth um, mandibles that were that were stacked on top of each other. But nevertheless, there's there's definite sorting of bones. They haven't all been just you know jumbled in together. Um, it's clear that you know long bones. Um, often were put together. Um, the skulls were often put together, um, and you know this this is a a, a feature that you see at Udinova as at other sites um, where you have these these large mountain -man structures. Um, one of the key key things about this, um, I think I remember even when I started um, studying, you know this. This part of the world. One of the one of the the debates that went on for a long time during the, the 80s and 90s, I think, was whether or not the mammoth bones that you find at these structures were um, hunted, or whether they were were gathered, whether they were literally um, found on the landscape um, from you know mammoths that had died of of natural causes, for example. Um, and then brought to these sites and then used as building materials. Um, and so this this was something that I, I remember being being discussed. Um, and if, if you look at um, certain um, publications, like you'll you'll see this this being this being um, brought up as a question. But certainly at Udinova, um, the um, the mammoth bones. Um, Represented in these structures, um, the vast majority of them, if not all of them, um, come from mammoths that were hunted. Um, so you can see this. So first of all, from the fact that you have um, bones that are found in articulation, so they were put there with the flesh, or you know, or with some, you know, some some flesh still on them. You can see there. There's some some leg bones that are found in, in articulation, also some vertebrae that are found in, in articulation. The now this is not my this, you know this is this is why um, I'm you know leaning very heavily on on what my my my, my colleagues you know, very long work on on this 
on this site. Um, but from a zooarchaeological point of view, the, the age profile of these mammoths indicates that they they were hunted. It's, it doesn't. It's not um, consistent with a natural mortality um, uh, curve. Um, there appears to have been deliberate smashing of brain cases to extract the the um, the brain material, um, which is not something that you know would have happened if you were if you were taking in. Um, you know, very old skulls that, that had been, you know, weather, weathering and, you know, um, em empty out. And the, the weathering of the bones themselves is um, homogeneous. It, it doesn't, it, it's not consistent at all with, you know, the idea that, you know, these, these bones were found like out in the landscape and then brought to these sites and used as, as material to build these structures. That absolutely, you know, is, is not consistent with the, with the evidence that, that is, that is found here at the site. And the, the question of mammoth hunting is another, um, another debate that, you know, when I started was, you know, was really um, a little bit, uh, you know, it, it was kind of a, a little bit of a hot topic for a while. It was like, you know, were people actually able to, to hunt mammoths during, during the Upper Paleolithic? And then we started getting some quite direct evidence for this. So, um, for example, the site of Lukovskoye um, in Siberia, um, where the, um, the, the, there is um, evidence for, I mean, you can see it there, there's a, a vertebra with a um, part of a flint point um, embedded in it. And, that dates to the, the later Paleolithic, so quite close in age to, to the sites I'm talking about today. Um, and then, you know, also several more finds have been find, have, have been made, and so Krakow Spitzista, so dating to the um, later part of the middle Paleolithic, and then Kostjanki 14, dating to the very, very beginning of the upper Paleolithic. Um, we have uh, an ivory ivory point um, embedded inside a, inside a mammoth bone. Um, so we, what started out as being kind of a, um, something that, that was seen as a little bit controversial, you know, whether or not people were, were actually hunting mammoths during the Upper Paleolithic. I think now, given the, the number of finds that we have, um, it's, it's really, I don't think it can be, be seen as, as controversial anymore. Um, and then this goes hand in hand then with, with the, the work that's um, been done on things like um, mortality profiles and um, then you know, that goes into hunting strategies and so on. So there's a whole sort of really interesting literature that nice is beginning to build up on the, the details of mammoth hunting during the Paleolithic. Okay. Um, some of the interesting, some of the interesting um, aspects of these structures um, include the arrangement of crania that you find there. So, um, just to remind you what a mammoth skull looks like, there's one there on the left, and at Udinova, you can see that they've actually managed to sort of like rotate the head, the head forward, and um, Put it so that the the um, tusk sockets are like embedded into the you know in, into the the sediment um, where the where the structures are. And so often you find these these rings of of mammoth crania, um, and they again that's not really consistent with. The idea that these were dwelling structures because these these crania can be found, you know, like, um, you know, inside the inside the circles, um, and it doesn't, you know, it, it absolutely doesn't work with the idea that there was, uh, you know, there, there was this was like the middle of a, of a of a dwelling structure like that. That just I I I don't think that that is a very you know convincing proposition. Um, and there's other reasons as well to think that these were not the remains of dwellings. Um, so for example, the absence of hearths in the structures, or in, 
um, and where you do have hearts, often they're not, or not hearts, but like where you have the, the remains of, of burnt material, they're not where they should be if it was a, if it was a dwelling structure. So they might be like right up against the edge. Um, they're not in the middle. Um, there's no concentrations of fines consistent with floor areas. What I should note here is that there's actually quite a lot of lithic material which is found like inside the structures, like at the bottom of the structures. But I think that a better interpretation of that, rather than that they represent, you know, like internal house deposits, is that these structures were built on top of uh, an area that had previously been um, a site of activity. So there was, you know, you can imagine an open space where people had been previously making stone tools, doing their doing their thing, um, working, and then later on, at some point, these structures were built on top of that that same area. Um, because it, um, as we'll see shortly, they weren't the. Um, it's you know it's very unlikely that this that this whole site was created in just one one stage. Um, so the articulation of the bones and the the the, the condition of the bones, um, as I already mentioned, this all you know counts against the idea that they um, that these structures represent dwellings. So of course the question remains then, what were they? And my colleague Mikhail Sablin, who is um, the main author on the, the paper that's just come out about this, he wrote in 2019 um, about, about these, these same sites, um, that there is a very fruitful potential comparison with um, middens of the Ainu and Nif people um, in Japan and Siberia. Um, so this was in his, his first point of, of comparison that that he that he he used, um, which is yeah indeed a very um, interesting possibility because there is I mean from from the ethnographic material and the archaeological material from from that area, you know we have this great record of behaviour of, of people pay, paying a huge amount of attention to how they dispose of the um, remains of bears um, from ceremonies, the remains of um, hunted animals as well. So this is sort of then where 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 I where I joined in and I um uh, you know started to get really interested in this in this um literature about um ritualized middens about you know the, the different um kind of depositional practices that we have evidence for from the archaeological and the ethnographic records. So just to give you a few a a few short examples. Um, this is from uh, one of the Torres Strait Islands, um, where from the 1840s there's a um, a, a depiction of a, a dugong bone mound, and um, so dugongs are, are sea mammals which are which were hunted um, uh, quite heavily there. Um, which were, you know, an import, important part of the the important part of um, the economy and the the society of of, of, peop of people living in Torres Strait Island, um, and they had, you know, quite um, particular traditions of how of how they would dispose of these of of the, the remains of these of these dugongs after they've been um, after they've been hunted and after they've been um, eaten. So there were, you know, specific um, middening practices that are associated with these animals. Um, but there's there's so many more examples in the in the literature. So I mean, I'm just giving you a few examples here. But um, you know, they they're from all over the world, all different time periods. You know, all different sort of levels of complexity as well. Um, but it's it's also I mean, to me, it's it's something that like it's it's not surprising. I mean, it makes quite intuitive sense that if you are um, if you, if you hunt animals and if you have you know these you know we we know that that 
in societies where um, animals are habitually hunted, there there tend to be, you know, incredibly complex um, worldviews and ontologies that that go with this, um, and that you know means that there's there's also can be very there can also be very complex rules about like how do you do this respectfully, how do you hunt respectfully, and you know that goes with all the all the stages of the hunt, so from like pre-hunt preparation to like deciding when to hunt and where to hunt, and then going all the way through like how do you hunt, who hunts, etc. And then after you hunt, how do you how do you dispose of the, the remains of the animals so that you don't um offend the you know the, the supernatural beings, for example, who who look after these animals and who decide whether or not you get to be successful in future hunts. So you know this this is something that comes up all over the anthropological literature and you know it's it's fascinating and it's it's just a real really rich um part i think of 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 hunting people's um ontologies which yeah i i really i really got into it um the the work that i find the most um fruitful just for um, for for finding sort of formalized comparisons for this, and um, came from those studies of the of the Torres Strait Islander Dugong Bone Middens, and so Ian McNiven, who um, has done a lot of work on this, um, he came up with a, a sort of a, a quite uh, generalized um, interpretation of them, where he talks about what sets aside these what he calls ritualized middens from ordinary middens. Um, and so he, he gave three criteria to, to make that distinction. The first of them is referencing, um, which he defines as the inclusion of um, symbolically important material into the middens. So it's not just animal bones that you find in, in the dugong bone middens. You also find um, other material, but it's, it's, it's not just any material. It's material that's symbolically important. Um, the second criterion that he, he gives is discrimination. So the um, uh, the, the, the choice of what goes into these middens um, is quite is quite controlled. So it's it's not just um, indiscriminate um, inclusion of you know um, material from all, all all different types of animals or all different types of um, waste from from a, a from, from your activities, it's it's something very specific that goes into these into these middens. Um, and then the third criterion he gives is mounding, which is the deliberate piling up of material to form conspicuous conspicuous structures. Um, and what I find amazing when I was when I was reading this and you know thinking about the dean of a, was structures is that all three of these um, criterion criteria that you know were created for an entirely different um you know archaeological and um ethnographic context are um they have really clear analogies at Udino. So referencing um is certainly present in that um inside the 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 structures you also find um some material that um is arguably Symbolically important, um, the ivory uh, artifacts, personal ornaments, um, and then sometimes uh, artifacts would be found like inside tusk cavities, for example, or inside mouth cavities. Um, so you might find a piece of fossil or a piece of ochre like put inside one of the tusk cavities, um, or uh, um, that sort of thing. Sorry, please excuse me. My voice is on the way out um, you'll have to bear with me I'll do, I'm gonna do my best um so the this you know this 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 idea of referencing I think is is, is very well supported at Udinova the um, idea of discrimination is also very well supported in that um inside the, the structures you know they're you know they're very 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 um heavily dominated by by mammoth mammoth bones and in particular, um, adult mammoth 
adult, adult mammoth skulls are ex extremely well represented inside the structures. Um, and then finally, the idea of mounding is also well supported. So it had already previously been argued that the structures at Udinova were probably buried. Um, and this was based on the condition that the bones there are found in. So they're, they're found in, um, they're not heavily weathered. It's only the ends of certain bones that might have been, um, you know, at the edge, at the you know, sort of sticking out of the structure are more heavily weathered um, or have um, evidence for gnawing. So the, it, it was previously, um, previously argued that these structures were probably um, covered with sediments, in fact. Um, and for some other structures, um, so Mezun and Majiric, um, as pointed out um, by Konstantin Gavrilov, um, the fact that, you know, many of these, uh, so many of the bones found to those sites actually had ochre paintings on them. Um, and it's, you know, that's not something that would have survived out in the open for very long. So they also could well have been covered with sediment. Okay. And the, you know, this, this all ties um, back in then to, to, to ideas about mammoth hunting. What were, you know, what was the worldview of, 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 of people who were, who were mammoth hunting? What was it like to, to depend for your subsistence at least some of the year on these very large and very dangerous animals like what sort of um what sort of uh social kind of uh supports would you need in order to to to, to enable you, you to 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 do this um to me like it's a it's a yeah it's, it's a really it's really fascinating insight into into how people might have lived at this time and so what i want to do now is just to invite you to to look again at some of these um structures that you know you, you might have previously thought of as being the remains of dwelling structures and just look at them again and just ask yourself whether in fact they might um not be dwelling structures at all and might in fact be the remains of collections of bones that were hunted, that were, um, you know, the, that, were, that were treated well, and that were, you know, brought together in a, in a particular way that was, that was clearly important in, in some way to the, to the, to the people who, who were, were living at these sites. So this is Majerit again, Mazin. It's Junkie 11 and Udinova. And then I think pretty much the last point I want to make is just about the, the amount of meat that's represented in each of these structures. Because we did, for the paper, we did some sort of um, back of the envelope um, back of the envelope calculations about like how much meat is represented in each of these structures. And um, it's a lot, it's a lot. So we sort of, we, we went on the, the assumption that each structure might represent one single episode of uh, activity at the site. Um, and most of the evidence there is, is I, I think, you know, all the evidence that we have from there is, is consistent with, with this idea. The seasonality information that we have from the mammoths indicates that it wasn't just one single season um, that the, the mammoths were, were being killed at. Um, it was, um, there's evidence of being, being killed from spring, summer, and autumn and winter. The Arctic fox skeletons, if we assume that they might have been wanting to get the, the early winter coats, which is, um, you know, the uh, early winter is when the fox 
um, for his, or, you know, other peak condition. Um, they might have been uh, focusing on, on trapping and hunting them then. And so you can, you know, all of this is consistent with uh, a long period of, you know, or a long range of um, uh, occupation time at the site. And then the, the fact that the, the bones were, um, you know, probably put together, or, you know, probably assembled um, when they were, when at least some of them were, you know, in very, very fresh condition. Um, and then, you know, put together in, in, in mind, you know, that, that to me, all that all sort of points to the idea that, you know, each, each mind might represent one um, period of, or one episode of occupation. Um, and the amount of food then that's represented in each structure, if you, you know, if you make a you know, certain assumptions, um, we're talking a huge amount of food. So it would be enough to feed, so on average, a uh, hundred people for literally months. So literally, you know, four to seven months is the, is the average is the average figure. But actually, some of the structures are a lot smaller than the others. So some of them only have about ten mammoths represented in them, according to the number of skulls. Um, so that that might be, you know, somewhere between two and four months. And then some of them have thirty mammoths in them. So that might be more again. So that might be something like you know six to nine or six to ten months um, for for a hundred people, which is just a you know a, a number that that we chose just as to, to give an example of the 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 scale of what's represented here. That obviously doesn't take into account the possibility that you know there might have been uh, meat being processed and taken off site, um, and preserved, um, distributed off site, um, and also for you know. The, the possibility of wastage and so on um but whichever way you look at it you know there's this to me like represents really good evidence for potentially very large numbers of people coming together and spending large parts of the year together so i, I don't think we're looking at necessarily like a, a fully um sedentary society here but what we're looking at is i think um people who had you know, as part of their seasonal reign, uh, a very long period of residence at this one um, at this one site, and you might have come back to it um, either you know several years in a row, or you know at, at at different intervals over over a slightly longer period. Um, and then just to make a few other final points, I mean, the the thing about like you know, oh, it's ritual, like that's, you know, literally sort of a joke now for archaeologists, right? It's like, uh, if you can't explain it, it's ritual. But I think actually, as Paleolithic archaeologists, we've been a little bit too shy about calling things, um, calling things ritual. We've been sort of a little bit too quick to try and find like very um, prosaic, sort of like economically driven explanations for things. And um, Joanna Brooke, um, amongst others, um, has has pointed out that like the this this the dichotomy that archaeologists have between like ritual and and secular, you know, that obviously doesn't apply to most societies in the past, um, or indeed in the present. Um, and uh, so, to me, the, the idea that um, you know people might have been uh you know putting a like a heavily sort of like ritualized um slant on their their day-to-day -day activities like that that i don't think is should be surprising um and the the last point i wanted to make is just um tying in with that is you know there's been a lot of work on um for example um carcass transport and like utility indices and you know if you and, you know, this is especially associated with, with Lewis Binford, you know, the idea that if uh, if you have killed an animal, you know, two kilometers away from, from where you want to 
to, to, to eventually consume it. What parts of the animal is it worth carrying back? And um, a lot of these mammoth bone accumulations in, um, in Central Europe as well have been a little bit of a, a head scratcher for people because you know they've, there's been so many of these like non-economic, like non-economically um, interesting uh, parts of the animal are very well represented there. And so to me, actually, the, the easiest explanation for this is, is simply that there are, there are non-utilitarian transports, sorry, non-utilitarian reasons as well for carcass transport. So it's not just economic um, questions that are, that are, are driving people's decision making. It's also, it could also have been, um, you know, sort of, you know, ritual or like non-utilitarian um, non reasons. So reasons to do with like the respect for the animal, the respect for um, the, the spirit world, or, or for example, you know, whatever it might be, um, that meant that, you know, it was important, for example, to, to take care of the heads, to, to make sure that the heads came, came back with the rest of the, of the body. Um, and I don't think we should be surprised to find this in the archaeological record. So that's all I want to say. Um, I hope that was, I hope, I'm, very, I'm sorry about my voice. Um, and um, my thanks in particular to um, my collaborators on, on this work and um, especially, um, you know, who especially they did all of the, the work for many, many years on all the, the zoo archaeology um, of this, which, you know, is obviously the basis for, for, for these, these new interpretations. Um, and there is a paper which just came out a month ago, um, which gives you fuller details of, of everything that I was talking about today. So thank you very much. Thank you very much, Natasha, for this uh, both critical and inspiring lecture. Um, I have to stop the...